Good afternoon. I'm George Blumenthal. For the past uh, year, I've been the director of Berkeley's Center for Studies in Higher Education. And for the previous 13 years, I was the chancellor at UC Santa Cruz. I wanna welcome you all today to our discussion of the challenges and opportunities for California community colleges in responding to COVID-19. Today's discussion is in some sense a follow on to the forum that the center held over a month ago. And that one was entitled Financial Impacts of COVID-19 on Higher Education in California, which dealt mostly with impacts on the University of California and the California State University system. That earlier forum can be viewed online by going to the Center for Studies in Higher Education website and clicking videos, CSHE lectures and events. And you can do that if you wanna view that video. But today we wanna to talk about the California Community Colleges. And I want to remind you that this event today is being recorded. Let me begin by introducing our other panelists. Jim Hyatt is a senior research associate at the Center for Studies in Higher Education. And previously, he was the vice chancellor and chief financial officer at the University of California, Berkeley. Eloy Oakley is chancellor of the California Community College System. Previously, he was president of Long Beach Community College. He is also a member currently of the University of California Board of Regents. Judy Minor is the chancellor of the Foothill De Anza Community College District. That means she's the leader of a group of community colleges within the larger system. And Larry Galizio is the president and chief executive officer of the Community College League of California. Previously, he was president of Clatsop Community College in Oregon. Before we begin, let me share a few details of today's presentation. Each panelist will speak for about 10 minutes. We will leave time for questions from viewers at the end, which I will ask. Some questions will be those that you submitted when you RSVP'd for this event. For those of you viewing this on our live YouTube feed, you can submit questions through the chat function of YouTube. You may have to sign into YouTube using either a Gmail address or your Berkeley email address to use chat. And as I said, today's panel discussion will be archived and a link to view it will be available on both the CSHE website and the Berkeley Conversations site. Before I turn to the other panelists, I'd like to say a few words about the California Community College system. The community college system in California has the highest enrollment of students in the United States, serving more than 2.1 million students annually. Indeed, nationally, more than one in four community college students in the United States attends the California system. There are 115 individual community colleges in California, including the rather new online community college called Calbright. According to the 1960 master plan in California for higher education, community colleges among their other roles serve as a bridge for any high school graduate to be admitted to a after two years to a public four year university. Indeed, roughly 80,000 community college students transfer each year to either the, United, the University of California or to the California State University system. By that measure, the community colleges have been a great success, though it is in the public interest to continue to increase those numbers. Despite their success, the community colleges have not been without controversy in recent years. The creation of Calbright, the online community college, was, by, was opposed by some as being duplicative of efforts on other campuses. And the statewide funding formula to distribute funds among community colleges put in place a couple of years ago has also generated some disagreement. There are many similarities between the community colleges and the UC and CSU systems. And as I said, we had an earlier discussion of those two systems. 
all three systems are all are highly dependent on state funds from California's government. Because of COVID-19, they all moved online very quickly this spring, which of course incurred some additional costs. All three systems face cuts in state support for at least this coming year and probably for several more years to come. Each system received CARES Act funding from the federal government, though the act, as you'll hear in a few minutes, was less generous to community colleges. And each system needs to provide advising and other student services online as we go through this COVID experience. There are also a number of key differences between the community colleges and the UC and CSU. For example, the budget for educational purposes comes in different proportions. For the University of California, roughly 40% of their, of their educational budget comes from the state of California and the other 60% comes from tuition. For the CSU system, it's pretty much reversed. 60% of their educational budget comes from the state and 40% from tuition. And for the community colleges in California, it's almost completely, their, bu their budget comes almost completely from either the sta state or local governments. UC and CSU have significant student housing whose budgets are very much affected by COVID. UC and CSU have significant enrollment of graduate and professional students, which the community colleges do not. The community college infrastructure, in other words, their buildings, have been funded by a series of state bonds, except of course in 2020, and they have access to local bond initiatives as well. On the other hand, UC and CSU have not had a state, state bond measure passed since 2006. So with that introduction, let me now turn to the other speakers. And I'd specifically like to turn the discussion over to Jim Hyatt. Thank you, George. Um, as George mentioned, my area is, is in finance. And so I'm gonna talk a little bit about the finance implications of COVID-19. And what I wanna do is to go back to the great recession of 08, 09 and how it affected community colleges, both within California and also nationally, and then go to the specifics related to funding that we see in the governor's budget and um, the impact of the CARES Act on California community colleges, and then some other issues that I think we need to talk about. So to start with, um, the Great Recession, as it was called, and its impact on community colleges was um, about as bad, uh, as bad as the Great Recession of 08, 09 was for sectors of the economy, it was really a boom for community colleges from 2007 to 2011. The number of students enrolled at community colleges nationwide soared by almost 25%. As the economy slowed, however, people returned to school, necessitating, as the economy slowed, people returned to school, necessitating expanded program offerings at more staff to support the influx of students. Larger student bodies translated into more state funding to expand educational opportunities. But as the economy improved, students left school to re-enter the workforce, leaving community colleges with fewer students and less money in their, in their budget. With budgets reduced, programs and staff were cut, driving more students to jump to leave the institution and leave colleges in an even worse state of affairs. So it was sort of a boom, kind of a boom and bust. Uh, nation, nationwide, similar sort of pattern. Nationally, according to a report that was published called the National Post-Secondary Enrollment Trends Before and During and After the Great um, Recession, community college experienced dramatic increases in enrollment after a delay of one or two years. So it took a little bit of time for it to grow. And then the proportion of students enrolling full-time in public two-year institutions increased slightly and four-year institutions saw virtually no change. Persistence rates, which is the Canadian enrollment with any, within any institution, fell as the cohort size surged, particularly in community colleges. The impact on post-secondary institutions was not immediate. Community colleges and for profits saw the greatest increase in enrollment, mostly among older students who showed up later uh, in the recession. Now, to understand the impact on community colleges, George has mentioned, it's funded from a variety of sources, but as, as George pointed out, largely from the state. So looking at the Legislative Analyst Office and its uh, view of the budget, uh, Prop 98, uh, which includes both the general fund and local property tax, represents uh, $9.8 million for community colleges as a whole, about 62% of the, of the budget. 
Other state money, general fund, lottery, special funds, about 6.7%, and other local enrollment fees, other local revenue, 28.83%, and there's a small amount coming from the federal government. So you can see that the impact of the, of the recession on the state of California is fairly significant, particularly as it relates to Prop 98. Now the current financial data reveal the shattering immediate impact of the coronavirus on the state economy. With more than 4 million Californians out of work and applying for unemployment insurance, per forecast projected drop in sales and income taxes received by more than 25%, which is pretty dramatic. With health and human service caseloads, and COVID-19 expenses costing 13 billion, the state revenues fall to 41 billion. The state will save a, will face a $54 billion budget deficit for 2019-20 and 2020-21, according to the forecast. The general fund would plunge to under $100 billion, the level it was at in 2011-2012 at the end of the Great Recession. Instead of three billion more in funding next year, the officials for Governor Gavin Newsom's administration are now projecting possibly 18 billion less over two years for K-12 and community colleges. That amount, an historic decline of more than 20% in the constitutionally guaranteed minimum level of funding would have a devastating impact on education unless Newsom and the legislature took other actions to reduce the cut or lessen the impact. In his March 13th, executive order, Governor Newsom promised to fully fund districts and charter schools for 1920, that's the year we just left, holding them harmless at Prop 98 levels that the legislature passed last June, as long as they provided distance learning, meals for low-income students, and child care for essential workers. Now in June, um, the, we, June we were faced with a $54.3 billion two-year deficit driven by the coronavirus pandemic. The 133 billion budget for the last fiscal year, July 1st, will start to build up a wall of debt. This is another concern. The uh, part of what was dealt with in the recession was the use of debt. And debt does come back to haunt you in, in time. It defers 12.9 billion in payments to schools and community colleges and borrows 9.3 billion from other funds to avoid steep cuts in the hope that Washington, which passed the CARES Act early on, will pass another stimulus act in October. Nearly overnight, the revenue drops from the COVID-19 recession uh, knocked the constitutional level of school funding more than 10 million below what it was in last year's budget. Uh, this is according to H.D. Palmer, a spokesperson for Newsom's finance department, who added the K-12 spending deferrals to avoid significant direction schools are really critical. The blueprint that the current gov that the current is currently before the governor, uh, which he signed, entails some upfront plan uh, pain that states two higher education systems will lose a billion combined and 2.8 billion will be slashed from state employees' compensation, which we made up by which would, which would be recovered by if federal act occurs, we get additional funding. But the approach to put off cuts to protect residents um, most in need from the unprecedented crisis risks. Again, a debt burden that may be years to dissipate. California joins other states, rating reserves and counting on hypothetical federal dollars to deal with the pandemic induced downturn that has already resulted in the loss of more state local jobs than were seen in the previous recession. And you can just watch the count of people filing for unemployment to see that. Now, as George mentioned, community college did receive, higher education did receive funding under the CARES Act. And the CARES Act. However, um, shortchanged two-year public colleges because of the way Congress structured higher education funding in the stimulus package, according to a study by the Center for American Progress. Now, it was using numbers that um, related to full-time equivalents, not, not headcount. So the study recommends that Congress make changes if it sends more aid to colleges and universities in another stimulus package, noting that CARES Act funding, as I indicated, was based in number of full-time equivalent students enrolled, which worked against those of large numbers of part-time students, which would certainly be community colleges. As a result, while community colleges educate almost 40% of the students, they only received about 27% of the CARES Act funds. The study found, and had the budget been based, however, on the total number of students, public colleges of two years or fewer would have received 39% of the funding. So how this new stimulus act uh, is drafted, has to take into consideration um, non-traditional students and the community colleges in particular. 
Now, some of the other fundings that are facing uh, community colleges uh, in other states, in California and other states, are the availability of computers for low-income students to access online learning platforms. In our previous webcast with community for with California State University and UC, this came up as an issue for some of those institutions, that their students that were low-income didn't have the kind of equipment or, again, the access to the broadband internet connections to really avail themselves of online learning. So that's something that really needs, and I think, I think this will be talked about, needs to be addressed. And then again, the reductions in state support are significant. As George pointed out, there's 150 community colleges in the state of California, which is quite a few, but the districts that they're in are very different in terms of economic uh, situations. And so some may be better positioned than others in terms of dealing with this, this crisis. So um, George, that sort of summarizes where we are, I think, financially. Great, okay. thanks. thanks so much, Jim. Let's turn now to uh, Eloy Oakley, Chancellor Oakley. Thank you, George. It's a pleasure to see you again. Um, so let me just um, add a few points uh, to, to the previous presentation. One, um, as of um, Monday, um, when the Board of Governors meets with the California Community Colleges, we will have 116 colleges. We have our newest <laughs> community college in Madeira, uh, which is wonderful, but it, um, it just gives you a sense uh, that uh, we really do serve the state of California from the Oregon border down to the Mexico border. Um, the other is, uh, I think, pointing out the challenges that we faced in the last recession, which, was, which were significant. And um, Jim described the boom in enrollment. Um, this is primarily due to the huge demand that our colleges always face during a recession. In times of high unemployment or high underemployment, uh, individuals come to the community college with the hopes of being reskilled, having an opportunity to improve their economic mobility. And in this current economic environment, with this work, workforce that's changing before our eyes, we expect to see another surge. Um, as this economic crisis continues to extend and the huge numbers of unemployed continue to persist. The challenge we faced in the last recession are, are several. One, you know, with regards to our own revenue, uh, we were losing revenue at the time that we were seeing increases in enrollment. Uh, when I was president of Long Beach City College, uh, we literally had over 4,000 students on a wait list to get into transfer level English, a basic fundamental course to support students. I'm hopeful that that won't be the same situation again, but that is, those are the challenges that we face. Our cycle is sort of a counter cycle to the California economy. As uh, unemployment increases, as the economy goes into recession, we lose revenue because of the Prop 98 guarantee, but, we see uh, increases in enrollment. Uh, so this crisis, the way it's starting to unfold, one, um, the health crisis hits our communities the hardest. Our colleges are in and serve the most under-resourced communities in California. These are communities of color, these are low-income communities. So you see this triple hit to our communities. One, the public health crisis, two, the economic crisis, our students, our families are the most vulnerable. And three, the social unrest that's gripping our nation is magnified in the communities that we serve. So I'm very proud of our colleges and the way that we responded. The faculty and staff have done an amazing job of adapting quickly to the needs of our community. But the fact remains that we continue to be the most under-resourced system of higher education in the nation. We don't have control over our tuition. We can't raise tuition to increase revenue, our tuition is set by the legislature. Um, second, we have one of the most generous college promise initiatives in the country. Uh, well, more than uh, half of our students do not pay tuition, which is wonderful. But again, this, this creates this challenge of how do you continue this with declining revenues? Um, and then the, the, some of the other issues that we're facing uh, include the adult workforce. So you have millions of working adults who may have a high school diploma, may have a little bit of college, 
and their jobs are literally disappearing before our eyes. Uh, so our colleges are in the best position to meet that demand, but we need you know, statewide focus on ensuring that we have the ability, the resources, the flexibility we need to reach those adult learners uh, who are in some of the most vulnerable positions in the economy and reskill them or upskill them so that they can continue to have a foothold in the economy. So the demand is great on our colleges. Um, you know, one, we have a recession, two, this public health crisis, and three, and I, and I can't um, underestimate this. Uh, our colleges, just like the CSU and UC, are, our students are under constant attack by a hostile administration in Washington, DC. The amount of time and energy that we spend defending our students, whether they're DACA students, whether they're um, uh, documented students, whether they're international students, whether they're non-Title IV eligible students, it's a constant battle to ensure that our students and our communities have access to the quality education that they deserve. So um, I'm very proud of the way that our colleges have responded. Um, they are some of the most resilient faculty and staff, and we have some of the most resilient students in the world. Um, but uh, without uh, more resources in, in the incoming years, we're gonna have a hard time meeting the demand that uh, California is gonna have for our uh, public community college system. Great, thank you so much, Eloy, thank you. And uh, let me turn now to Judy Minor, Chancellor of Foothill De Anza. George, thank you so much. It's really great to be here with everybody today. Um, I thought I'd give a brief glimpse into some of our COVID responses to date and um, four takeaways about important areas of attention um, that might be helpful to others as we think about, you know, how do we proceed? Um, one is frequent and caring communication. Two is highly inclusive consultation. Three, timely alerts to instances of COVID. And four, piloting a contact tracing app. Um, first is to frequent and caring communication. Our first district-wide memo about coronavirus was January 27th and was followed by seven additional messages leading up to March 11th, when we announced that Foothill De Anza would move to remote learning on March 16th for all classes, except those that could not be adequately completed without an in-person component. I should probably add, we are uh, two of the three colleges in the state that are left on the quarter system. Um, the shift for us coincided with the last week of classes for the winter quarter 2020, and it was followed by one week of finals and one week of spring break. Instruction for spring quarter 2020 was delayed by one week, and we thank the chancellor's office for that permission in order to provide professional development for all of our employees to prepare for 100% remote learning as of April 13th. I mentioned caring as a characteristic of our communications because this has mattered to so many so often of the time as we are hearing the kinds of anxiety that not only our students are feeling, but our faculty and staff. This is certainly um, so unprecedented as a way of working and knowing that it's hard to tell when it will end um, certainly creates additional um, anxiety. And I do have to say, I've been so pleased at the success of my weekly open office hour. Certainly when I did that back on the campuses, I'd be so tickled if I got maybe 15 or 20 people. Um, it started out with about 150 and now I typically have about 250, 300, just for updates, shout outs for the great work that people are doing and just them uh, having time to ask their own questions and, and to share some of their own stories about what they're doing. As to highly inclusive consultation, during March, um, we made numerous phone calls and had meetings with faculty and staff le leaders for advice in advance of district-wide directives. Um, it was such a great chance to learn how to anticipate ways to support remote work that we might not have thought of. And on April 16th, I met with the presidents and chief negotiators of our five bargaining units and two meet and confer groups classified Senate and academic Senate presidents, the colleges, senior staffs, and the, the chancellor's cabinet. The student body presidents were invited, they weren't able to come. Um, but I convened this group in order to seek their reactions to our current thinking at that time about summer 2020 and fall 2020 class schedules 
and asked for all of their reactions um, to these two, two proposals. Shall we schedule summer 2020 classes totally online with the exception of allied health programs? And two, shall we schedule 2020 classes fall um, online or hybrid in preparation for the possibility of a return to shelter in place during fall? For summer, there was clearly great appreciation for the urgency to establish a schedule in the midst of many unknowns and overwhelming agreement that we continue with online and the fall 20 plans required a bit more time. This group was so helpful as a sounding board that I've asked them to serve as my consultation task force as we consider program consolidations and budget reductions. So they will continue to be a sounding board for me through June 2021. And their role is to share information, provide feedback, and integrate thinking from our discussions into the governance structures at the colleges. And if it sounds a little complicated, it's because we are inventing it as we go. On May 12th, I sent a message to all employees that there would be two forms of instructional delivery in fall 2020 classes that are 100% online, and then the second choice for them is classes that are hybrid with face-to-face -face instruction that can move to online should public health matters dictate a return to shelter in place. No courses will be scheduled as 100% face-to-face, and I do think we're seeing that trend more and more throughout the country. I might also mention that throughout the spring and summer, uh, summer quarters, staff and administrators have all worked remotely. We have had a few people needing to go in because of maintenance of the buildings. Um, in the case of our payroll department, we wanted to make sure that um, checks and, uh, and uh, bills have gotten paid. And I've been just delighted that our foundation staff have made sure they've gone in to make sure that no checks have remained uncashed from donors. As to timely alerts to instances of COVID, in the past month, we have had two instances of COVID. Those are the only two thus far that have been reported. One employee and one patient in the Foothill Dental Clinic. Notifications to our district employees were within 20 hours of our being informed. Contact tracing was very time consuming but sanita sanitization protocols went quickly as we did have a clear plan in place. And the, the timeliness of all these alerts really helped people feel confident that we were on top of the situation, that they wouldn't necessarily be coming back to the campus uh, without knowing what was going on. And so I, I very much appreciate all of the faculty and staff who helped that happen in a timely fashion. And the other area I just wanted to mention is about piloting a contact tracing app. We spent 72 hours in doing the contact tracing for our employee. It was because we had to look at the um, paper logs that we had of who had been in what building at what time. And had we had a particular app, we could have actually accomplished this in 20 minutes. So we did um, meet with a group called OptimumHQ.com, and I'd be happy to put that in the chat in case people wanted to follow up on that. Um, they've been very helpful customizing it for our particular needs. You can fill out the form in about 30 seconds and it can track you then as you go into various buildings. Um, we're using it with our employees that are on the campus for allied health programs or students in allied health programs. And De Anza opened their child development center this past Monday. And so we'll be able to also use that for the families that are checking in their children. So if we have any outbreaks there, we will know who is where, when. And um, we, we think it will just really be a good tool to have. So I hope the, the ideas about frequent and caring communication and highly inclusive consultation, along with timely alerts to instances of COVID and piloting the contact tracing app might prove as helpful examples. But I do wanna end with the best news of all that in the midst of everything, we were so fortunate to find the permanent president of De Anza College. And so as of July 1st, we are privileged to have Dr. Lloyd Holmes, who comes to us from Monroe Community College in Rochester, New York. And he, you know, his board approval was June 3rd and he was already um, uh, zooming in and working with us at that time. But um, we're so excited that we have some amazing leadership like that in times when we so desperately need a great leader. So thank you and I'll pass it on over to Larry. Great, thank you so much, Judy. Um, Larry, you're up. Well, thank you, George, and, and thank you, Judy. I think great leaders 
are attracted to work with great leaders such as yourself. So, um, you know, it's great, excellent to hear what you're doing. So uh, first, I, I wanna thank you, George, and for everyone at the center for focusing on the California Community Colleges. You know, as, as has been said, despite the fact that we're the largest and certainly the, the most diverse system of higher education, not only in California, but in, in the United States, uh, attention is often directed elsewhere. So I think uh, this speaks highly of, of the center. And although you mentioned in, my, in, in the short bio that I was a president in Oregon, I'm a native Californian. I went to Santa Barbara City College. Trans, you know, it was a transformational experience for me. And it was and it enabled me to, to graduate from the finest public university in the United States, if not the world, UC Berkeley. Go Bears. So uh, even though I, I, I took a detour to Oregon, it's wonderful to be back home. Uh, a couple things that I, I would like to uh, touch on that, that have, have already been mentioned. Um, you know, the chancellor made, a, I think, a really important point about the, the so-called Great Recession back in uh, 07, 08, 09. And yes, uh, Jim, as you mentioned, the enrollment increased substantially uh, during that period. But as Chancellor Oakley pointed out, and I think this is really important for us to remember and for policymakers to, to remember is at that time when people were, Californians were trying to come back to the California community colleges because of the disinvestment and the necessary difficulties, education, higher education was rationed and 600,000 or more Californians were unable to come to one of our institutions, which as the chancellor said, are all over California to upskill, retrain, and attempt to get back into the workforce. And so as we confront this virus, as we confront unemployment at record levels, the capacity of California community colleges is so critical for the short and longer term economic development and strength of California. Not only do we transfer you know, 80,000 students, uh, and also, not only do we have, you know, some 20,000, we will graduate some 20,000 of the critical infrastructure, workforce infrastructure, as identified by the Department of Homeland Security. So whether it's nurses, EMTs, firefighters, respiratory therapists, those people largely get their education and training and certificates um, at California community colleges throughout the state. And in this global pandemic, we need nurses, we need EMTs, we need respiratory therapists. So it's important to the extent possible and policymakers have very, very uh, difficult choices of course, but it's important to try to maintain the capacity of our institutions so that we can work with those who are unemployed recently or long-term and get them back into the workforce. Uh, it's just absolutely so critical. In the, in, and, and also just dealing with the virus in the shorter term. We need that those healthcare providers and others. So I think that's something that we have to keep in mind. And the, the other thing I think it's important to, to recognize, and, and I was going to, to mention this, but Chancellor Oakley did a fine job of just talking about who our students are. And uh, some people use the term post-traditional to describe uh, a lot of our students. And, you know, as many brochures that have the 19 year old with a backpack sitting on a lawn with lazy rivers, um, we have some of those students, but of course our, our institutions are a picture of California in terms of the diversity, the geographic diversity, the racial and ethnic diversity. The age demographics and, you know, our, our median age is not 20, you know, it's closer to 28 or 30 or 32 years old, uh, people, you know, adults in the workforce who often have children. And I know uh, Chancellor Minor and, and Chancellor Oakley and I have, and all of uh, our colleagues in the system have heard, so, you know, so many stories about families where somebody's lost a job and whether it's a student or the parent. And so people are making just very difficult decisions. So 
uh, faculty, staff, leaders such as Chancellor Minor and Chancellor Oakley are doing whatever they can to facilitate either maintaining enrollment of people who are, have precarious lives in many, in many cases and are, have just been uh, facing such difficult circumstances. Uh, the, the advantage I think that California community colleges have is in advance of the pandemic, uh, our colleges across the state offered online opportunities. Nowhere in, the, nowhere in the number that we do now and have to do now, but because faculty and staff and our institutions have been offering online um, education in a variety of disciplines, we were poised uh, to migrate. Now, it, it's not without its challenges, especially uh, for certain courses. And as Chancellor Miner mentioned, for those courses where you need lab, where you need hands-on work, whether you know it's healthcare or others, uh, districts and colleges are figuring out how to maintain some type of safe, uh, with physical distancing, uh, training and education in those so-called career uh, education. But some 90% or more of our offerings now are online and you have faculty and staff who've been doing this. So I would say to any student who's concerned about the education, it's a work in progress. At the same time, California community colleges are, are ready to, to do that. I would like to, to sort of step back as well, especially considering it's the Center for Higher Education and you study uh, higher education. I think when we look at, at California community colleges, uh, it's really important to, to situate us uh, within the historical context because you know we're looking, you know, you and others, we're all looking at what can we do as California public institutions of higher education, and also our, with our K-12 partners. Um, the popular narrative for California community colleges and all community colleges is that we're opportunities colleges and democracies colleges, right? We offer opportunity. Uh, you know, tuition is low, or for for almost you know more than half people don't have to pay tuition. Although of course living costs, the non-tuition costs are the most expensive and that's a huge problem for our. But we were historically created to offer greater op opportunity uh, known then as junior colleges, right? Providing access to po post-secondary education as the economy changed. Uh, also the popular narrative is that we're democracies colleges. As the nation and, and as California grew, citizens in a democracy and a pluralistic democracy needed to better understand uh, how that worked and be educated. And we still perform those functions gladly. At the same time, uh, when, we, when we formed at the turn of the 20th century, uh, institutional maintenance was also really important. And, and the role, one of the roles of California community colleges, and it's not a very popular narrative, is that we were utilized to divert less academically inclined individuals um, so that the Berkeleys and the Stanfords could maintain that elite status. And, you know, the great thing about the community colleges is, I think there's a recognition of that, but we embrace the fact that we work with those students who often have had very difficult lives, maybe have not been as academically successful, but then lo and behold, uh, we work with them and 80,000 them of them are gonna be at CSU and the UC. But I think it's important to recognize that uh, because throughout the over 100 uh, plus years history of California community colleges, we've been underinvested and underfunded. It's just a fact. Uh, so before the pandemic, per student funding for a UC student is about $33,000. For a CSU student, per student funding about $18,500. And for California community colleges, the per student funding is about $8,300. That was before the pandemic. Now we don't begrudge, we want more public investment in all three institutions. And we think the, the, um, uh, the public benefit in addition to the private gain is, is really worth it. But I think it's important to recognize that. Uh, it has been, the, the funding formula was mentioned and I know that was something George that you would hope that we, we talk a, lot, a little bit about that. I mean, again, first and foremost, it's really important to understand that we are the lowest funded sector of public higher education. 
We have 2.1 million students that we're trying to serve and our function and our mission is absolutely critical, especially in a pandemic. Um, so the critique of the old formula, the old formula was based on enrollment. And the critique of that formula was not only that we didn't get enough state investment or local property taxes, but the critique was that you're simply, you're, you're, the incentive for institutions is access. And access is absolutely essential. That's, that's in our DNA, that's core to our, uh, a core part of our mission. However, if you looked at the data, especially for students of color and underserved, underserved students, those that were actually obtaining degrees and certificates, uh, th those numbers were unacceptable. And so as several other states had already done, there was a desire to create a different set or an additional set of incentives. Very controversial, right? Uh, if you talk to any faculty member, any president, any chancellor, any trustee, anyone who works at a California community college, they would tell you that their focus is student success. And it's true. At the same time, if you're a policymaker, you're looking at the numbers and you're concerned. So in the final year of Jerry Brown's tenure, um, the, the student-centered funding formula was created and instituted, and it's a work in progress. Um, like any funding formula, it has a lot of uh, critics. Funding formulas inevitably have winners and losers, so it's very challenging. But at the core, the theory, whether or not you buy it, but the theory is that if we have 70% or so based on enrollment, we're still maintaining access and then providing incentive for access. 30, uh, 20% would be for uh, supplemental grant, and that is to encourage districts and colleges to enhance services and strengthen the recruitment of underserved students, those who are on Pell Grants and, and, and others, kind of recognizing rewarding student uh, districts that had larger numbers and had more success for students of color, underserved students, um, those who are Pell, uh, Pell recipients and AB 540 or, or some undocumented students. And then 10% based on uh, performance and outcomes. How many students earned a degree? How many earned a certificate? How many finished math and English in their first year? And a variety of other metrics. So prior to the COVID-19 world in which we are, there were a lot of concerns about the funding formula and uh, Chancellor Oakley uh, has heard them several times. And so I won't, I won't provide the pain that uh, you know, he, he's already had to, to go through that. But there were you know, a lot of concerns. And one of the, I think, most legitimate concerns is because it was done quite quickly, there was not um, simulations done that really could predict a so-called typical recession, let alone a, a pandemic. And so there's an attempt to kind of adjust the formula based on where we are. And so right now for our colleges, you know, how will recruitment and how will student success measures be impacted by COVID-19? That's a real question. And I think we're all kind of grappling with that, the Department of Finance, policymakers, the chancellor and, and, and all of us. Um, the last thing I would say is just, I perhaps should have said this earlier, there might be a little confusion because, uh, you, you know, unlike the CSU or the UC, which are systems certainly with a capital S, uh, we're a little bit unusual and uh, some would call California community colleges more a confederation of locally governed districts, uh, somewhat more akin to K-12 model. Of course, we were born of K-12. And so, you know, it's not enough that Chancellor Oakley has 17 or 18 board of governors uh, uh, that, that he has to report to and, and the governor. Um, uh, he, he, we also have 430 some odd locally elected trustees, 137 or so CEOs, because we have some multi-college districts, but we have a bilateral governance system. So we do have the state agency of the chancellor's office. We do have a board of governors, which is statewide, but the league is the membership organization for all 73 districts and soon to be 116 colleges. So we're a voluntary organization that's membership organization for 30 years, Every district has been a member and our job, and we're often and most often aligned with the chancellor's office in advocating for uh, California's community colleges, holding uh, conferences, having professional development, 
and trying to do the best that we can to support and uphold the, the absolutely essential mission of California's community colleges. And I'll stop there. Great. Well, thank you so much, Larry. And actually, thank you to all of our panelists, because not only have you given us something interesting to chew on, you also did it in a reasonable amount of time. And therefore, we've all we've left time for enough for questions, questions from our viewers and questions that were submitted beforehand. So um, let me start with a question, um, which is really more of a general question. Um, do you view the COVID situation as a catalyst for evolving higher education, in particular for evolving the community colleges? And um, maybe I'll turn first to Eloy and ask Chancellor Oakley if uh, he has any thoughts about that. Well, it has to be a catalyst. I, I don't think that, um, I mean, if we, we come out of this in the status quo that we were in before we went into this, shame on us. Uh, we have an obligation to take the current crisis, to look at what's happening, to look in the mirror, to see the, the structural racism that has been <clears throat> highlighted uh, so clearly, uh, both in public health um, in opportunities for quality uh, higher education, um, as well as the challenges uh, that the economic crisis has created, as well as you know the social unrest. Um, we have an obligation to take this as um, a call to action to make change, to find ways to increase uh, quality access to higher education, to find ways to reach more adults in the economy and help them uh, gain a foothold in the new economy. Um, we have an obligation to improve as a state, uh, to be able to reach more communities, to give them the broadband access that they're going to need to participate in higher education as well as the economy. It's shameful that so many of our members in the community have little or no access to broadband. We have to look at the, in the mirror, take account for where we are, take responsibility for improving um, our state. And I think we will. I think we have uh, the will, both from the governor to the legislature to the leaders in higher education to seize this opportunity. Uh, so uh, I am hopeful that we will, and I'm confident that we will. Great, thank you. Would any of our other panelists like to weigh in in addition, Judy? Um, you know, I would, and this is really timely, actually, for you to have this question because um, Eloy, through the, the state chancellor's office, has set up a trustee fellowship, which is a kind of professional development program for our trustees and our chancellors working together to really advance the vision for success. And um, we had our first session together. There'll be a follow-up. We've had homework. And what's really great about the focusing of the work in this way is that our own trustees are now saying the way they will conduct board meetings and the way they will interrogate us about the investments of the public's dollars in student success needs to be more visible. Um, it needs to be more constantly monitored and um, where we say we want to, you know, equity matters. What is the proof of that within the budget? Um, and so what, what we might have thought of initially as going into this is like, oh my gosh, one more thing to do. It isn't. And we do have this opportunity um, to, to make some dramatic change, which we should have anyway. Um, so I think the increasing number of tools that we have and the leadership that we do have from Chancellor Oakley for some of not, not only just conversations, but accountability and coming back to each other um, and talking about this really matter. So I'm very much looking forward to what we will be able to do, particularly as we do have to look at budget reductions. Great. Would any, uh, Larry, do you have something you well, want to add? Yeah, I mean, we, we have to. And community colleges, I think in many cases are very ad adaptive institutions. Uh, if you look at the mission, uh, it is amazing what we've seen statewide, uh, whether it's counseling sessions through Zoom, phone calls, social media, handing out laptops. Uh, it's a work in progress. It's not perfect, but I, we, there's, we will, I think, take lessons from this. At the end of the day, though, I think 
face-to-face -face, uh, instruction and, and meetings are still really critical, but yes, uh, we have to adapt and, and hopefully we'll, we'll take the lessons from this and, and be better. George, let me just comment. I think that it's important to folks what's happening within the state of California, but the state of California is relying heavily on a new stimulus package to be delivered to the states. And I think that it's really important for us to emphasize to the at the federal level, I mean, Washington administration has not been, as Eli points out, all that favorable. We do have representation though in Washington, DC. And I think it's important to get those issues that are facing us on the table at the federal and the state level. Because if we don't do that, um, we're really relying on the state to bail to, to, to do to address the issue. And it clearly, based on the budgets, is unable to do that. So I just add that question, that, that comment. Hey, George, if I can just add uh, a fine point of what uh, Jim just mentioned. Uh, literally, as we speak, um, Congress is debating how to fund the HEROES Act. Literally right now. Uh, so I would ask every single one of our listeners or viewers right now to send an email, to pick up the phone, to talk to the congressional representative now, especially Speaker Pelosi. We need to ensure that community colleges, that the HEROES Act supports community colleges and are funded on headcount, not FTES. And that conversation is literally happening as we speak. Yes, as a matter of fact, uh, right before this started, I received a text from the National Community College Association asking me to ask Chancellor Oakley to call Speaker Pelosi on that very point. So I will now deliver that message. And But it is, I mean, Jim, you, you pointed out the, the disparity. And again, with you know, record inequality in this nation. And you know, we have some students who, choose to attend the California community colleges who, who are not underserved or in a lower socioeconomic status, but the majority of them are. And if you want to at least give the opportunity, we, we need the investment. And so, yes, I, I would echo what you said, Chancellor Oakley. Great, I am pleased we are being so timely with this presentation. So um, let me turn to a different question, which I've received several versions of. And, um, but, but basically one version of that question was, how long will reserves last? In particular, what financial strategies are available to, uh, to bounce back and basically navigate the possibility of staff layoffs and furloughs? Judy, well, do you want to, oh, yeah. please Eli, go, go for I, it. I'm just gonna say a few words from the system perspective and then obviously turn this over to Judy who has to wrestle with this uh, in real time. Um, we are very concerned about, uh, in the system office, very concerned about the, the physical health of many of our districts. Some of our districts are in rural communities and we're struggling with enrollment before this challenge. Um, the deferrals, which do prevent uh, at least offset cuts for now, cause uh, districts to borrow money in order to make up for that deferment of revenue and make their payroll. Um, so it's important that we, as quickly as possible, uh, do what is necessary to come out of this fiscal crisis and reduce the impact of those districts that were already, whose fiscal health was already challenged. Uh, so that it is a major concern in my office, the number of districts that are in fiscal crisis continues to grow. And um, uh, I honestly don't know if we can wait another year or two before we find some relief for some of those districts. If, if I might, um, you know, we in not too many months, we have an, uh, an election. Uh, I have a feeling everyone here is aware of that. Um, you know, we have two really important propositions, uh, Proposition 15 and Proposition 16. And in addition to needing to overturn Proposition 209, so that race can be at least one of the uh, elements of consideration for whether it's the UC, the CSU, or for us in contracting. Um, the adjustment to Proposition 13 so that businesses of a certain size are paying their fair share uh, would be an infusion of dollars that would not be a panacea, but would be substantial and really help uh, invest in this uh, really this public good of higher education. Right. Judy? 
Um, well, we're already talking budget reductions. Um, we've had some strategies at Foothill De Anza for building a stability fund, um, certainly coming out of the last recession. And we felt we were caught a little bit of unawares <laughs> um, in, in some ways for uh, the depth of various recessions. For us, there were some changes in enrollment because we're located in Silicon Valley, um, housing is so expensive. And that's been such a challenge for our students, for our faculty and our staff as well. So um, we do think that we have a sufficient stability fund right now. We are planning um, a set of reductions in staffing were we to need it. Um, a part of it is being worried about whether or not there would be federal backfill for um, what California is counting on for our systems. And just not knowing how long the pandemic will go and just the other kinds of problems that are there, particularly for our communities, um, as, as they have always faced housing insecurity and food insecurity in, in the recent years. And this has just exacerbated that problem for them. So our needs um, to, to help them out and so a, a big part of the conversation that we're having at Foothill De Anza is, in a sense, how do we start the conversation, not with the budget reductions, but how do we invest in those programs and services that best serve the most vulnerable students in accessing our programs and services and being successful? And so it's a slightly different way of approaching um, how we will do the work that we will need to do, knowing that we can't do everything that we have always done. Um, and I really want to do a shout out to all of our collective bargaining groups because we're in the midst of basic aid districts that um, have a capacity to give much more generous compensation than we do because we basically have to earn our FTES and our apportionment. And so um, the fact that we have had a lot of uh, patience and forbearance with some years of no increases or some years of off the schedule increases that um, then go away. I, I'm just really proud of our folks in, in standing up. I, I think that speaks so much to the dedication that's there. And in these times, gosh, I would not want to be anywhere else other than Foothill De Anza because it is such an amazing team and an amazing community. Great, thank you, Judy. Um, so we had a question that came in uh, not long ago. Uh, basically said that because of the anticipated loss of employment, because people will be losing their jobs in a recession, the question is, will we have more of a statewide focus at the community colleges on competency-based education and micro-credentialing? Um, Who would like to take that on? Judy, is, are you, would you like to take that question? Well, I can say we're trying to do more collaboration um, in the regions. And I think the um, work that uh, Vice Chancellor Ch Shenny Weber has done around um, the workforce allocations and uh, more kind of encouragement around regional collaboration so that there might be some scaling of what we can do in that regard. Um, and we're part of the Bay Area Community College Consortium, again, really great leadership out of Cabrillo College from Roth Fotenauer. And so I'm sure that we will have more conversations about what kinds of things, what might we even look at by way of some consolidation. There were about eight colleges that were led by both Foothill and College of San Mateo for Amazon Web Services cloud computing, which is so great because it's not place dependent. And there's so many jobs in those areas. So. I think looking for the ways we can collaborate together, um, whether it's statewide or regionally or across sectors, um, I think there's much more conversation going on in that way. And it's again, we have to. So there, there are some pluses for what we're in a sense forced to do that we may not have done very naturally before. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if I could add, George, um, uh, competency-based education is a critical uh, component in the future of our community college system. Um, we have to be able to more quickly, more flexibly reach uh, early adult learners. Uh, and that's where CBE has been very effective with adult learners. If you see the huge growth in the mega universities that are reaching adult learners, it's Western Governors University, Southern New Hampshire, Brandman University, all have large components of competency-based education in their modeling. 
Uh, Calbright College, of course, is our first solely competency-based education uh, model college. Uh, and we are working on Title V regu regulatory changes that would allow all of our colleges the opportunity to begin to deploy uh, CBE. Great. Thank you. Um, this has been a tremendously stimulating discussion. And I'm, I sadly have to tell you, the hour has gone by and our time is up. And I really want to thank all of you for joining us today. I want to thank all of our speakers. And I'd like to thank our audience for joining us. As I said earlier, this, re this, uh, this panel discussion has been recorded and will be available online if you or anyone else wants to view it later. Our next presentation in this series will be COVID-19 impacts on US United States research universities and research activities and on international collaborations. And that's scheduled for August 3rd at 11.30 Pacific time. So I look forward to seeing uh, you then. Um, again, I wanna thank all of our speakers today. Uh, they've done a fantastic job. I think it's been a great discussion.